all, uh, important to know that uh, us Maritimers, we stick together. And uh, so she's bound in duty to say kind things, and I appreciate it. So, uh, so first of all, I'd, I would like to, uh, I would like to uh, express my appreciation for being invited here uh, this morning. Uh, I, uh, I live in the commercial uh, world for the, for the most part. I'll try a bit to help out and offer a helping hand where I can. You all live in meeting the needs of our society, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate, uh, admire, respect uh, what you do, and I hope that uh, today's agenda, which appears to be quite uh, robust, is helpful in uh, your uh, journeys and in uh, meeting your goals. Uh, so, so this morning, very first thing, uh, around 8.30 in the morning, going to talk about leading change. Uh, I have uh, 19 minutes, so uh, prone to verbal diarrhea, so uh, unfortunately I, I think I'll be able to keep it within 20 minutes. I'm told I have to, so... Um, uh, the subject that you, uh, that you all have chosen to explore today is uh, transformation and hopefully some of uh, my own uh, personal experiences, not that they're uh, you know, revolutionary, there's many in all walks of life that have gone through similar types of uh, things in their, in their careers, personally, professionally, but maybe this can add to your own uh, thoughts around transformation and leading change in the transformational uh, process. So uh, let me start with a little bit of an advertorial uh, of who Maple Leaf is. We are the largest uh, food processing uh, company in Canada. Uh, our culture is defined by passionate people who are passionate about food. We uh, employ about uh, 19,000 people in the country in operations across Canada, the United States and the UK. Uh, we have number one brands. Uh, these are our six as of yesterday. Cut that in half. The bottom tier, are, unfortunately, aren't with us any uh, any longer. Uh, but um, uh, we do have number one brands, number one market shares, uh, and uh, uh, and an organization that, in every respect, uh, I have a deep uh, love and and uh, respect for, and uh, a great passion for the people and and business that we that we do. Um, Having said that, over uh, we joined the Maple Leaf organization in uh, 1995, uh, and in 1995, since then, uh, I think we would uh, conclude that uh, we have an organization that is change hardened. Now, that's an important concept. Actually, is an or is inside an organization in a culture is is uh, is the organization change ready, hardened, uh, accustomed to the journey of change uh, inside the organization. I actually think that that's a, a core skill, a muscle in the organization that is important to develop. Uh, but we, uh, we come by that uh, honestly in the sense that w for the last, uh, for the last uh, almost 20 years, we've a number of different uh, uh, forms, types, uh, structures of change uh, uh, as it's unfolded uh, over that uh, couple of decades. Um, uh, one of the mottos inside our organization as it relates to facing these kinds of uh, transformations in the organization of different, different forms is, the, is the, you know, the core belief that uh, is the only path to future opportunity. That embracing transformation, change, is the only path to future opportunity is important to underpinning that muscle inside the organization, underpinning the, the desire and the will of the organization to go uh, from you know, one place uh, to, uh, to some place very different. Uh, through that uh, two decades, uh, two decade long journey, we've faced things like uh, the imperatives of having to look at our fundamental cost structure in, in, uh, in labor agreements, uh, which uh, as you know, can be quite um, uh, you know, compelling probably the second hardest thing that I've ever had to do uh, in, uh, in my career is ask people to adjust their compensation uh, across the country. And uh, it was uh, very, very difficult, uh, involving very significant and in some cases hardened responses, but, uh, but it was uh, absolutely necessary to the survival of the business. Uh, change associated with, uh, with acquisitions we made in a 10-year period 30 acquisitions over 10 years, so that's uh, uh, a pace of uh, two or three a year or more. 
And uh, that, that's a different form of change. It's, uh, it's cultural alignment, it's integration, it's all of the elements that go with you know, that kind of, you know, we're, we're, we used to be this big, now we're this big. We used to have these types of cultures, now we've got to blend that all into one you know, common uh, DNA. Uh, so all of the change that goes with acquisitions over a long period of time, with the change that's attached to uh, economic uh, shift, right, when, when in our case as a Canadian manufacturer, currency goes from 65 cents to parity, fundamentally impairs your business model and you're having to deal with the, the, uh, the, e the economic anatomy of that, uh, to the change that's attached to something like a crisis that occurred in our organization in 1998. Uh, 23 people died on our watch. We live in a world that is very passionate about our products and, and what we do for a living and the sustenance behind those products. And 23 people die on our watch and we're accountable for that and what that does to the organization. The resulting change, the only way we could find meaning in such a tragedy was to commit as an organization to become world leaders, to become absolutely world leaders uh, in food safety uh, from, uh, from end to end. And I think we've uh, met that commitment over the last five years. But uh, you know, a huge organizational, uh, organizational moment uh, in, in transforming the organization, changing the organization in important ways. Uh, through the very difficult issues of change simply based on the different views of the same set of facts in, in something like shareholder activism. You can take the very same set of facts and have two entirely different perspectives on what to do with it. No dispute about what those facts are, just a very different view in something like, for example, in 2010, facing a shareholder dispute about whether or not we should fix a business that's been impaired by currency shift or sell it. Fix or sell, and what's the appropriate response to that? Again, same fact base, different points of view, different perspective, and, uh, and the, the changes and, that, uh, and transformations that get attached to that. And then finally, over the last seven years, as a result of uh, you know, many of the other factors in a globalizing food industry. We live in a country of 30 million people. We are a $5 billion business with 19,000 people in the organization. And my number one job is to convince people that we actually work in a country store because we're really tiny relative to the global competitors that we face in the, in the marketplace uh, day to day. We're actually pretty small on the spectrum. And so uh, as that whole world of globalizing in the food, globalization in the food industry uh, is taking place, you know, we have to invest in that fix or sell equation, uh, $1.3 billion in our asset base uh, across the country, uh, improving our productivity by 65% from coast to coast, uh, a very, very difficult change in going from an asset base or a, a plant network you know, as a manufacturer that is basically the Smithsonian all the way to intergalactic manufacturing in the span of a few years. And, and so all of that, you know, when you look at that two decade journey, I, I would say about our organization, I mean, some people might say we invite this stuff. Uh, other people might say we're good at handling it. I think those are two different perspectives, but you can, uh, uh, you, uh, you can look at that two decades journey and say, as an organization, the one thing that I can say with confidence is that we are change hardened uh, across the Maple Leaf, uh, the Maple Leaf uh, world. Um, when you look at that two decades of experience, uh, I tried to assimilate uh, for the purpose of your agenda today, what are, for what it's worth, uh, kind of free advice, probably worth what you paid for it, but, but what it's worth, what are the key insights that we would draw uh, over that two decades of experience of some pretty hardened changes that have occurred uh, inside the Maple Leaf uh, organization. And so being a lover of David Letterman style lists, uh, we, I created uh, the top 10 uh, list insights that would come from that. And uh, I'll start with you know, the very important uh, uh, principle which you uh, I undoubtedly will relate to is that change, fundamental change or transformation has to begin with a purpose, right? A purpose that is that's uh, insightful, it's communicable, that people will relate to, they understand, uh, that connects right back to, uh, you know, so much change is, uh, is uh, rooted in incrementalism, right? Like it's, it's, I gotta get to the other side of the river, uh, let me, you know, put my foot on the next rock that's gonna get me there, as opposed to dreaming about what, the, what it looks like on the other side of the river. Stephen 
Covey said it best, you know, begin with the end in mind. And understanding, uh, right, that, uh, that, that journey and its purpose, you know, is essential, I believe, and in our experience, to getting through the hardest, the absolute hardest of, of changes and transformations that you can endure in your organization. And number two is, it's, it really is all about the execution and executing that change with precision. People need to see and feel the precision in that execution, right, of how you actually, uh, how you actually um, uh, uh, plan it and get it done. We have, a, we have a very disciplined Six Sigma culture in the Maple Leaf organization. Uh, we approach changes like this and projects and project management with you know, an absolutely maniacal amount of detail. Uh, we use a PCAD model of planning in the in extreme, communicating, over-communicating, uh, acting, and then debriefing in a kind of a circular, circular loop. And it's all designed to be really, really precise in the execution of the changes that you commit to. Number three uh, on the list is, uh, is over-communicating. Um, you know, I think uh, as a leader, uh, you know, we always wonder whether or not we're communicating enough to our people. And uh, you know, I think the general rule is whatever amount that you're communicating, it's not enough. No matter how much it is, it's never enough. It is impossible actually to over communicate. And particularly when you're going through change, that, you know, as long as people understand through that change, as long as they, they get it, they understand the destination, they understand what's expected of them uh, in, that, uh, in that journey, if you over-communicate th you know, throughout the entirety of your organization, right, the, the, by and large, the people will come with you. They'll, they'll join you on that journey you know, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, allow them to through communicating openly and honestly and directly with them, even if it's, even if, if it's uh, bad news, right? And we've, we've found in, in our case, uh, we found in our case, you know, t gone, gone to ex extreme, taken in conventional wisdom, risk, in some of the communications saying to places, you know, in, in, uh, across Canada that your facility is going to close in three years' time and there really is not going to be a job for you here in three years' time. And we're telling you that right now. Whereas conventional wisdom in a lot of organizations is, no, no, don't do that. I mean, they'll, they'll all leave and they'll do this, they'll go here and they, they won't work anymore, they won't be committed and yada, yada, yada. Uh, as opposed to telling them now and, and giving them the respect of, honesty and planning and, you know, just being straight with them. And what we've found in many cases in those situations, I give more examples than not, where their productivity of those locations, the performance of those locations actually improved in that three-year period, right? Largely because people want to do a great job. They want to do the right thing. And as long as you treat them fairly, as long as you're honest and open, at the end of the day, they will, right to the very end. And so um, uh, over-communicating is, uh, is, uh, is uh, certainly Part of that and being straight with people, even if it's a, even if it's a hard message. Uh, number uh, four is uh, managing ad adversity well. Uh, certainly a lot of uh, the types of changes that we've gone through has involved a lot of adversity. The leaders in the organization, the hundreds and hundreds of leaders in the organization, have to personally manage that adversity and they have to manage the adversity of, that's felt by the people in their organization well. That includes things like managing stress and understanding the stresses of your organization and how to, you know, how to, you know, f feel your way through that, uh, you know, individual by individual, uh, you know, including just things like managing your own personal, you know, health through all of that. Uh, in the most stressful times going through, uh, through uh, you know, some of the, the deepest adversity that we've had organizationally, professionally, I'm sure all of you have experienced this where you say, oh God, you wake up in the middle of the night and you know you can't sleep that particular night. You know, the number one rule is you know, go get on your exercise bike and you know, have a good workout, even if it's two o'clock in the morning. It's the right thing to do. It helps you manage adversity uh, and stress for the whole organization, right? For your whole organization, uh, manage, that, uh, manage that well. There, we, have a, we have a lot of different coping mechanisms that we spend time teaching and talking about in managing that adversity uh, through, uh, through our organization. Uh, number five, uh, probably the single most important leadership principle in our experience uh, is, uh, and, and undoubtedly well known to most of you, but I, can't, I don't think it can be said enough, is that EQ, 
or emotional intelligence is more important than IQ, right? In fact, you know, I would state that in, uh, uh, differently and say that, in fact, if you want to inspire the troops, probably your IQ is more threatening than it is inspiring, right? There's nothing, the, most people, when you're trying to inspire the masses, most people will find IQ uh, intimidating, not inspiring, right? And so uh, being able to attach to the emotional intelligence of your, of your organization and, and tap into that as a, you know, as the core uh, of leadership um, is, you know, essential in, in, in the changing process, right? So those that get up and try and intellectualize their way through transformation, by and large, probably won't have a lot of people, you know, behind them in that, uh, in that journey. So, so um, you know, we spend, uh, we spend a huge amount of time inside our organization in the leadership journey, in individual leadership um, uh, journey of the organization and individuals in the organization, teaching, preaching, talking about, you know, how do you lead, uh, you know, with, uh, with emotional intelligence uh, as opposed to uh, intellectual, uh, in, as opposed to IQ. That doesn't mean that we are a, an organization of dummies, but but at the end of the day, it uh, you know it does you know just sets the priorities uh, I think properly. Uh, number uh, number six is that in the process of transformation, you know accountability is essential, but it has consequences, right? And and I think that's you know we spend a lot of time talking about you know what is the nature of accountability, right? Um, in uh, it's part of our culture. Accountability is, is part of, of what we talk about uh, on an individual and collective basis uh, inside our organization regularly. And we spend a lot of time actually exploring what does, it, what does accountability look like? What does it look like in your behaviors? And, and it's easy, very easy to embrace the notion of accountability. But where the rubber hits the road is when you attach the consequences. Because you know, an accountability without a consequence, by and large, is very sterile, right? It doesn't have the same, you know, traction inside the organization. And, and having people embrace accountability, even though it may come with some serious consequences, right? In the case of, you know, we, we certainly had to demonstrate that in things like the food safety crisis that we experienced in 1998, or sorry, in, two, in uh, 2008. Uh, you know, when we, you know, joined hands and said, we own this and we're going to accept accountability for it and there's going to be really serious consequences. I don't even know what those consequences will in the full, in the full you know, scheme of things. Uh, you know, I had a bunch of lawyers, bunch of lawyers suggesting that maybe the, you know, the consequence might of just accepting accountability might be the demise of the organization. Well, I guess that's, it is what it is. We're still accountable. So, you know, uh, attaching the consequence to the accountability and having a culture where the organization and the individuals in the organization are willing to stand up and accept that accountability with a consequence, you know, is essential to that to, to the journey of transformation and leading change, as well. Um, uh, number seven is leading from the heart. Uh, I've always believed that there are, you know, you can you can uh, you can hire somebody's uh, hands and. Uh, pay for them. You can stimulate their head, right, and get their head, uh, but you really have to inspire their heart to get the, to get m the most. In the the head, heart, hand model, you really need to get tap into the individual's heart to get the discretionary commitment of change because because it's hard, right? It's hard work. It's the discretionary effort that gets you to the finish line. Not the gee, I come to the work, I you know I put in my, I, you know I put in my my time, earn my paycheck and, and go home. It's the discretionary effort that uh, that uh, leads a change, and that I believe can only be accessed if you inspire the heart. Uh, number uh, eight is uh, do don't talk. We have a an, a, an acronym inside our organization. It's G uh, S D. And we talk about it all the time. You know, we don't, when you're talking about, you don't just talk about change. It's like, what are you actually doing? What are you measuring? What are you, you know, what, what progress are you making? What actions did you take? Not talking about it tomorrow. What are you doing today uh, to get it done, to actually get it done? And we, we kind of talk about GSD all the time inside. The, for, for those that want to know, uh, GSD is get shit done, right? So we, 
We we do. That, I mean, that's that's it. Like we get we just get shit done. And at the uh, and and that's just part of you know you just the the the, the uh, mundaneness of uh, of uh, of change inside the organization. And number nine is perseverance because any amount of change uh, requires a perseverance to endure. Uh, there's always obstacles, and an organization succeeds in change if they have the willingness to meet whatever obstacle they face and overcome it. Right? No matter what the obstacle, there's a path to overcome it, and, and uh, that's uh, essential to the, to the success of a changing journey. And lastly, and most importantly, number one on the, uh, on the uh, list for us is the notion of a values-based leadership model. We have, we're one of the very few organizations, I think, that, that has the poster on the wall, but we really, really mean it. We have six core values in the organization. We teach it, we preach it, we measure it, we compensate against it, we talk about it constantly at all levels of the organization. We express those values not in mealy mouth ways, but in really tangible things like one of our cultural elements is deliver a winning result. It's not, you know, some mealy mouthed opinion about or view, you know, wording about about how to, you know, what does performance look like? It's deliver a winning result, right? And that is part of our, part of our DNA, and we express it in that way in our values. But most importantly, take the steps to live those values and make sure that there's no white space or as little white space as possible between the poster and the wall and what our actual behavior is when nobody's looking, right? And that's the, the definition, I think, of a values-based leadership culture. And, and I think getting through change Really being clear about your values uh, is, you know, essential to the, to the changing uh, process. So I don't know if this is helpful to you. I think I'm over time. I'm not going to allow you to go off, uh, off schedule uh, today. Leading change, I think, connects to the, to the, the topic of transformation that you're going to be addressing. And I hope these remarks were helpful to you. Uh, I hope you have a great uh, couple of days in uh, exploring a very important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.